Module 7, Relational Summary, Lecture GNP1, Courage in the Defense of Science. At our best, we use science and logic to make decisions, particularly those involving life and death and our fate. And as the science changes, rational people use the new data and the theories that emerge from it to make more informed decisions. Unfortunately, even as our science and the technology that permits it advances, we seem to be in retrograde motion about its application. A good example of this is the debate over climate solutions. For several decades now, pundits of renewable energy and pundits of nuclear energy have duped it out over which energy sources have the greatest potential to halt global warming trends. Recently, though, a study has come out giving strong data support to the notion that nuclear was never a good option, purely from a carbon drawdown perspective. The article was published in the esteemed journal Nature, and it's called, quote, Differences in Carbon Emissions Reduction Between Countries Pursuing Renewable Electricity Versus Nuclear Power, end quote. The abstract tells us, quote, two of the most widely emphasized contenders for carbon emissions reduction in the electricity sector are nuclear power and renewable energy. While scenarios regularly question the potential impacts of adoptions of various technology mixes in the future, it is less clear which technology has been associated with greater historical emission reductions. Here, we use multiple regression analyses on global data sets of national carbon emissions and renewable and nuclear electricity production across 123 countries over 25 years to examine systematically patterns in how countries variously using nuclear power and renewables contrastingly show higher or lower carbon emissions. We find that larger scale national nuclear attachments do not tend to associate with significantly lower carbon emissions, while renewables do. We also find a negative association between the scales of national nuclear and renewables attachments. And this suggests nuclear and renewable attachments tend to crowd each other out. Now, since they crowd each other out, and the evidence has been piling up for decades, why wouldn't we have gone all in for renewables long ago? Why won't we go all in now? Well, you know, politics. And the politics of the North are among the most powerful. When I was growing up, it seemed no matter where I went in the world, no matter how far south I traveled to sun-washed island and desert nations, ideas about the feasibility of renewable energy were always based on political and economic and feasibility assumptions coming from media in the North. If the northern institutions and scientific and economic papers and media outlets declared the costs higher than the perceived benefits, for them, we all listened. The New York Times would report that solar electricity and hot water weren't going to pencil out because of all the cloudy days in New York. And folks in Los Angeles and Phoenix would conclude they couldn't do it either. This is called the northern bias. It's already well established and well described in failures for biodiversity protection, but it rears its ugly head for renewable energy implementation. And it affects almost everything we do regarding sustainability on the planet. If the global north says it isn't ready yet, nobody else is allowed to be either. Comparative advantage and competitive advantage strategies drive business, right? And our business schools still are struggling to teach sustainable competitive advantage, if only because the quest for Pareto optimality and the international, uh, sorry, the internalization of negative externalities disrupt short-term windfalls and the gross inequities that are the real basis of global political power. It isn't as though we couldn't have had a total win-win. Back in 1994, President Clinton announced, we now have technology to ensure that we can have both a growing economy and a healthy environment at the same time. He told the nation on C-SPAN he would demonstrate and explain those technologies in just a few minutes, and then the screen went blank, and the announcers told us the president's address needed to be preempted so we could watch the verdict on the O.J. Simpson case. Really important. For the rest of the hour, we sat watching an empty courtroom in Santa Monica. We never got to see the technological breakthroughs the president wanted us to see. And we've got our priorities, though, all right? But it isn't like we really needed or need some new fandangled invention to stop climate change in its tracks, is it? But when you think about the message of the new film, Kiss the Ground, 
the one that we talked about in the previous lecture. And if you look through the hundred vetted best solutions in Drawdown, you see that so many, many of them are very, very, very simple. So why then do we bother to focus on supersized engineering solutions like new and improved nuclear reactors and mechanical carbon sequestration pumps and other radical forms of geoengineering, like the ones I talk about in my discussion with the robot in the class video, Technology to the Rescue, a critique of geoengineering schemes to combat climate change. You can see it in our suggested video lessons. Politics particularly the politics of the North with its northern bias and most particularly the bias toward bigger is better, which belies what former British coal board leader and economist E.F. Schumacher discovered when he started living in the South, in Burma. He saw how effective much simpler local and regional solutions could be and ended up detesting and exposing those biases, culminating in his seminal work, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered published in 1973, which I highly encourage you to read. Schumacher is considered the father of the appropriate technology movement. But even on the simple technology side, like thermal depolymerization and biodigestion and reforestation, the political class is painfully slow to support the ideas, preferring to throw good money after bad at the most inefficient technologies through perverse subsidies to the farming lobbies and fossil fuel lobbies. For example, according to a 2018 report, at over, quote, at over $400 billion in 2018, global fossil fuel consumption subsidies are more than double those for renewables, end quote. And that's a comparison between just three fossil products, coal, oil, and natural gas, versus dozens of renewables, hydro, microhydro, solar thermal, solar electric, offshore wind, onshore wind, biomass, biogas, other biofuels, geothermal, with hydroelectric, get, hydroelectric getting the lion's share. And all of these renewables have to compete for what's left of the subsidy pie, despite having the smallest market share and consumer base. You would think, with all of the attention now paid to renewables as the solutions to climate disruption, governments would flip the equation so that renewables got more help than fossil. But according to the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, quote, rather than being phased out, fossil fuel subsidies are actually increasing. The latest International Monetary Fund, IMF report, estimates 6.5% of global GDP, $5.2 trillion, was spent on fossil fuel subsidies, including negative externalities, in 2017, a half trillion dollar increase since 2015. The largest subsidizers are China, $1.4 trillion in 2015, the United States, $649 billion, and Russia, $551 billion. And according to the IMF, quote, fossil fuels account for 85% of all global subsidies. And reducing these subsidies would have lowered global carbon emissions by 28% and fossil fuel air pollution deaths by 46% and increased government revenue by 3.8% of GDP. An Overseas Development Institute study found that subsidies for coal-fired power increased almost threefold to $47.3 billion per year from 2014 to 2017. That's huge. The advantages, the benefits to society from subsidy removal are clear, but we aren't doing it. Why? Politics. In the lyrics to my optimistic music video about small as beautiful drawdown solutions called Consider It Done, I ask the question, why do we focus on big industrial-sized installations instead of home and community scale solutions, which in aggregate would solve the problem even as population grows because each household and business would be a solution instead of a problem? And why? Politics. People feared the world was going to end. Why 2K or 2012? Climate change disasters around the bend All our resources going to hell Complex engineering ruled the day Supersized in every way Still the word got out that many things Could be done in a simple way Consider it done
are always in our way. Economics still holds sway. Yet as long as we're still making waste, we've enough to get through each day. Garbage you need not make garbage out. Trash is merely in our minds. Food waste really sun shines. Energy, rain or shine, to be had for free. So the lesson for you and me is the problems that we perceive. All the problems we face today. It's very complex, but at the end of the day, I think it comes down to courage. The courage to go against powerful vested interests. I'm reminded of the speech the cowardly lion gives in Wizard of Oz. Remember this one? What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast to wave? Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? Courage. What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the Sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and tot so hot? What puts the ape in apricot? What have they got that I ain't got? Courage. And it is true, if you really ask yourself, why haven't I, a denizen of the rich industrial north filled with privilege, implemented as many of the drawdown solutions as I can? The answer, if you look deep inside, has to be our lack of courage. So we could rewrite the scene with the cowardly lion thus. What keeps me from composting or grinding up all of my food waste so it can turn back into fuel and fertilizer? A lack of courage. What makes me continue to cut the grass instead of planting perennials and shrubs and trees in its place? A lack of courage. What makes me send my SHIT and urine into a mega-sized and always overwhelmed multi-million dollar waste treatment facility when I could keep my nitrogen and phosphorus on site and turn it into soil through a compost toilet or renewable energy through a home biodigester? A lack of courage. What makes me throw out single-use plastic soiled with organic material that ends up in landfills emitting methane or in the ocean killing wildlife? A lack of courage. What makes me continue to use soil-destructive, health-compromising, non-nutritional cash crops and to eat wheat, rice, corn, potatoes, and sugar and meats that are grown in the same agro-industrial system? A lack of courage. What makes the Earth a planet that's getting so hot? A lack of courage. What's killing the apes in the rainforest so I can eat cookies and ice cream and use cosmetics made with palm oil though I know I should not? A lack of courage. What do people who strive every day to use simple technologies and lifestyle changes to live in a climate drawdown way got that I ain't got? Courage. And privilege. And the privilege not to exercise our courage. Now look, I don't really want to shame you for your non-action on climate disruption because that usually leads to resentment and rebellion. Lots of people are actually joining stupid reactionary movements like the rolling coal movement, driving around in the largest trucks they can get, removing the catalytic converters and pollution controls, and spewing as much thick black smoke into the air as they can in gestures of political defiance whenever they hear news about possibilities for some Green New Deal that they don't understand. It's a lot like the anti-mask protests. 
tell people they got to do something to save themselves and to possibly care for others whom they don't really care about, and they get mighty offended. Our courage from our privilege in disobeying political authority is often tied only to knee-jerk reactions rather than thoughtful and strategic responses. And when it comes to solutions, we don't really have much choice anyway, hence the frustration. Now, when was the last time you could go to the pump and actually choose between gasoline, natural gas, hydrogen, ethanol, methanol, various blended fuels, fossil diesel, biodiesel, and electric charging? As the great documentary film The Pump, produced by the Fuel Freedom Foundation, shows in detail, while consumers in Brazil and Germany and Hungary and Costa Rica, hell, even Egypt, can choose what fuels they use on a daily basis. In the US, your only choices are really varieties of the same fossil fuels with various detergents and octane boosters added. And from a climate perspective, that ain't no choice at all. We have even less of a choice when it comes to how we get our electricity and gas at home. So, I mean, when was the last time you saw a home biogas system in a Home Depot in the fossil propane obsessed barbecue section? You see, we don't really get much of a vote when it comes to the supersized solutions. We, we think we have a vote when we try to elect politicians who champion either the Green New Deal or who say climate change is a Chinese hoax. But the real voting power we have is with our dollars, with how we spend them, with the products we buy and how we implement them. And in a capitalist system, in a free market system, if only we lived in one, the rich and powerful are only rich and powerful because we buy what they have to sell. If we had alternatives on the market and could stop buying their products, they would go bankrupt and their power vanishes. You stop buying weed killer and non-native grass seed, stop paying for lawn services and leaf blowing, stop pay for, by paying for garbage pickup and stop buying processed food and junk at the supermarket or the fast food joint, and they lose their shirts while you and your local ecology gain your health. You stop buying propane or fossil gas and produce or buy biogas instead, and the fossil fuel companies go bust. You get an electric car and invest in a solar charging cooperative, and the auto industry and the energy industry are forced to change. It isn't about boycotting. It isn't about what you don't buy, because every time you refuse to buy concentrated animal feedlot operation or CAFO beef, some other hungry mouth comes along and keeps the company afloat. But when you buy regenerative agriculture-based silvopastoral beef and agroforestry tree cereals and you create a competitive landscape, that effort has to prevail because the former we know is unsustainable and the latter is sustainable. That's why we study these solutions in this program. This means that if you support the alternatives that are sustainable, by definition they have to be the ones to sustain. Otherwise they simply get crowded out. That's the nature of politics. As they say, money talks and bullshit walks, but here we're telling you that it's good when bulls are permitted to walk and shit in rotated pastures filled with complex vegetation, and when we allow chickens to follow them as the bullshit is trampled into the ground to peck and scratch and make new soil ecologies. That's throwing good money after some good bullshit, isn't it? The nice thing about these drawdown solutions is that they really can be made apolitical because they scale down and up so nicely. For big scale solutions, you need big scale politics. For small scale solutions, you're at a human level where families and communities can see the results of experiments with their own eyes and touch and implement and try. The other solutions are really hard for the voters to get a handle on or a feel for. Let's take an interesting and tantalizing new geoengineering idea for drawdown. The application of massive amounts of tephra, or volcanic ash, to the ocean. A recent article in Chemistry World says, quote, The team conducting the study calculate the depositing 50,000 tons of tephra, a bulk carrier vessel's worth, offshore could sequester 2,750 tons of atmospheric carbon dioxide. This, they said, equates to a cost of around 43 British pounds per ton of carbon dioxide sequestered, an order of magnitude cheaper than many proposed greenhouse gas removal technologies. The process could work anywhere where plankton grow in abundance but have low natural burial rates, as tephra deposits are available almost globally. Now on the surface of it, it isn't such a bad idea. As the scientists leading the project say, quote, tephra is cheap, not limiting, 
and all the required tech already exists. Bentonites, altered tephra, are already regularly mined, so we don't need to develop new approaches, end quote. But then, quote, two issues remain, the article says, the concern that tephra could harm marine ecosystems, an area which the research concedes, researchers concede needs investigation, and the fact that marine dumping in general is banned under the 1972 London Convention on Marine Pollution. Now, to solve these, we obviously need to engage in politics. But when it comes to changing your diet, to buying at farmer's markets, to replacing your lawn, to planting fruit trees and other useful carbon sequestering vegetation, do you really need to get into much politics? No, not at all. With a free market, you simply buy what you want, and that changes both the economics and the ecological consequences. You can't dump tephra in the ocean yourself, but if you live on the coast, you could participate in oyster reef restoration projects here in Florida that many of our PCGS students have participated in. That isn't considered political. You could participate in seagrass restoration and in coastal wetland restoration projects already approved by the Florida legislature and for which there is funding available. Coastal wetlands is drawdown solution number 52 in your book with restoration accounting for 3.19 gigatons of reduced CO2 and simply protecting the existing wetlands to, quote, keep a lid on the carbon they contain, estimated at 53.34 gigatons. And here in Florida, you could do as I have done and plant giant bamboo, that's easy. This is drawdown solution number 35, accounting for 7.22 gigatons reduced CO2 at a cost of 23.8 billion worldwide, but with a net savings of $264.8 billion. Easy to do. But will you do it? Only if it's advertised on TV and your favorite TV personality or star does it too? Does that include wearing masks? See, the politics of the North, despite our revolution against tyranny and no taxation without representation, are still the politics of the age of empires, the politics of would-be kings and queens and big men, the politics of the oligarchs, the politics of highly paid trendsetters who make decisions based on political expediency rather than scientific consensus. Nations that care for all their citizens don't conduct nuclear tests decade after decade and then, to keep the uranium and thorium flowing and the plutonium, plutonium stocks growing, as Amory Lovins points out, use public tax dollars to subsidize nuclear technologies that aren't economically feasible and have the potential for catastrophic failure under the guise of providing cheap, clean electricity rather than simply investing in energy conservation and efficiency measures that would obviate the need for nuclear power plants in the first place. And as for you, rather than voting for or against politicians who are for or against nuclear power, you could take advantage of the already agreed upon and government supported weatherization and insulation and energy star appliance programs and rebates and tax breaks for renewable energy and electric vehicles and a host of other hard-won incentive-driven project, incentive projects that would eliminate the need for another power plant in the first place. But it turns out the adoption rate of these programs is dismally low. I remember working for Demasa Utility Consulting in Northern California during my time as a graduate student to help pay my tuition. My job was to research and write scripts about renewable energy and energy conservation programs being offered by clients like Roseville Electric Company. And then I was to make PowerPoint presentations and shoot and edit public service announcement videos and educational videos. It turned out there was a lot of money available from the federal and state governments for reducing our energy consumption and cleaning our environments. The politics had already been done, but most people didn't know about them, didn't even watch the PSAs we put on television and didn't take advantage of the essentially free money that the local politicians had fought so hard to get for their citizens. You can see many of the videos that we made in the resources section of this module. The question is why? Why has it been so hard to get the people of the North, particularly the people of North America and mostly the United States of America, to take advantage of life-affirming drawdown technologies and techniques and ideas that were and are so simple, so effective, and ultimately so inexpensive. Inexpe the answer partially involves culture, and within each culture we tend to form culture clubs, 
a form of neo-tribalism that involves all sorts of issues surrounding loyalty and hierarchy and our desire for approval and social mobility. And it's tempting to say that people are simply greedy and profit-driven and it's all about the money. But that doesn't resonate with me. Does it with you? See, these facile judgments belie the willingness of so many people to sacrifice for God and country. They don't explain uh, our military service. They don't explain the inefficiency paradox and the huge trouble people will go to to do unsustainable and arguably uncomfortable things and endure the often life-threatening consequences of such actions that sustainability practices would completely eliminate. A good example is simply grinding all food waste in an in-sink garbage disposal and washing out plastic containers rather than dumping food waste into a plastic-lined garbage bin and leaving it to rot and stink in the dumpster, attracting rats and flies and causing disease, to say nothing, not nothing of releasing methane in the landfill. Like, like, why would you? Unless it's what your culture taught you to do. Another is endlessly sowing and mowing and spraying and watering inappropriate grasses that cost you valuable time and money and, and really do you no good at all from any practical standpoint. Why would you waste your Sunday that way? The answer is almost always culture and the politics of culture. Interestingly, the famous marshmallow test was recently reanalyzed and the results turned out to be quite different from what we originally thought. You remember the marshmallow test? It was supposed to predict success in later life. The idea was you give a little child a choice. We say to a kid, you can either have one marshmallow now, or you can sit while I go on an errand for a half an hour with the marshmallow in front of you and not touch it. And if it's still there when I get back, I will give you two marshmallows that you can eat. The kids who resisted the temptation of instant gratification were said to be more patient and goal-oriented and longitudinal follow-up tests showed that they did better as adults. We would like to assume that environmentalists and sustainability students like you were able to pass the marshmallow test as kids, and that is why you are the champions of leaving fossil fuels in the ground and riding public transit and bicycles and patiently waiting for the right season to buy your favorite fruit or vegetable. And, and even think about giving up sugar and marshmallows entirely, as my wife and I have done, because you know there are greater rewards coming down the sustainability pike for those who have mastered their need for instant gratification. It turns out, however, that things aren't exactly that simple. Actually, kids who are motivated by marshmallow rewards, whether it's a bird in the hand or two in the bush, can still end up as profiteers. And for them, the marshmallow test isn't about self-discipline and clarity of vision. It's about gambling and figuring out what the biggest payoff is. These folks still crave marshmallows. They've simply figured out a way to get more of them to maximize their sugar rewards. It doesn't imply any holistic sustainability ethos at all. Thankfully, the marshmallow test turned out from a psychological perspective not to be about marshmallows at all or about willpower or self-control. It turned out to be about trust in authority figures, uncertainty in expectations, and the desire for prestige and social rewards. Kids who felt they could gain socially from waiting by pleasing the adult conducting the test, for example, were able to muster more self-control than kids who felt they couldn't derive any social benefit from making the sacrifice. It's a lot about trust and mistrust. And doesn't this speak to the situation with following so many of the drawdown solutions? If the prevailing culture doesn't offer guaranteed social or political rewards that offset the risk of sacrifice, and if in fact your culture club will frown upon you or block or censor you or heap disapproval upon you to say nothing of threats and fines, why would you ever take risks or make sacrifices for the sake of something as abstract as the environment or the future? So I'll ask again, what is it that keeps so many of us from joining existing organizations that have already won the political battle, have the money, and are hungry for volunteers because they really need the labor power to get the job done? What keeps us from maintaining the commitment to the COP21 Paris Accords, like the 4 per 1,000 initiative for regenerating soil? Courage? Courage. Fortunately, as the wizard said to the cowardly lion, I'm here to tell you that you, as denizens of the dazzling emerald cities of the North, from Tampa to New York, from L.A. to Kansas, 
already have what it takes to beat this climate change. As the wizard says, you, my friend, are a victim of disorganized thinking. You're under the unfortunate impression that just because you run away, you have no courage. You're confusing courage with wisdom. You have plenty of courage, I am sure. All you need is confidence in yourself. There's no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger. The true courage isn't facing danger when you're afraid, and that kind of courage you have in plenty. So, what are you going to do about it?